Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for, for taking your Friday afternoon uh, uh, to be here at this very exciting lecture. Um, my name is Maarten Meijer. I'm a PhD student in uh, Groningen, a small university town in the north of the Netherlands, where I work on uh, what I've uh, um, uh, continued to call as uh, the political history of soil science in relation to uh, international soil governance. Um, and I'm organizing today's lecture uh, given by Narciso Barrero Basos uh, um, in close collaboration with uh, LONOS, the Center for Global Knowledge Studies uh, in uh, Cambridge, University of Cambridge, run by uh, Inanna Hamati Ataya and uh, uh, Samantha Peel. Um, who uh, I'm very thankful for their, their intellectual and, and uh, institutional support uh, in organizing uh, this event. Uh, today's lecture, uh, which I will uh, introduce a little bit more uh, in a minute, uh, is part, is a follow-up, as it were, as of um, a symposium that we organized at LONOS uh, in uh, last November on the politics of soil epistemologies. Um, during that, uh, that symposium, we had uh, discussions uh, uh, about, you know, ranging from uh, soil in contemporary international governance, um, the way uh, soil and discussions about soil care and sustainability feature there, um, the roles of, of soil and soil science in, in uh, eco-modernist attempts at reshaping modern cities, in the context of climate change, amongst others, uh, as well as more, more political aspects of uh, soil science or, or the question of how might we do soil science more politically. And as a follow-up of that, uh, that symposium and the discussions that we had in that context, uh, we're now very fortunate to uh, uh, be listening to Narciso Barrero Vasos. Uh, Narciso is a professor at the Autonomous University of uh, Querétaro uh, in uh, Mexico, if I pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't. <laughs> uh, I know I've, I've been familiar with uh, Narciso's work, especially in the context of, of uh, ethnopedology, which is, uh, if we uh, might put it like that, the study of indigenous or, or local forms of soil knowledge. Uh, and I've been in touch with Narciso uh, in the context of uh, the symposium that we organized and, and, and in the context of today's lecture. And, and when uh, I, I started having conversations with Narciso, I was very uh, uh, happily surprised that he, not only is, a, is he a, an anthropologist, if you wish, studying forms of soil knowledge, but he himself in many ways is a philosopher of uh, the soil himself. And uh, more than that, also uh, um, a practitioner, an activist of some kind, engaged in uh, the politics of soils in, in uh, the context of Mexico. So I'm very, very happy and very honored uh, to um, uh, hear you all welcome uh, to Narciso's lectures titled uh, Beyond Modern Soil Science, the eruption of a pluriverse of soil epistemologies in the global south in the Capital scene. Uh, without further ado, the floor is yours, Narciso. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I am very happy and I want to thank uh, you and Samantha and people from the Glocknos uh, Institution for, at Cambridge University for giving me the opportunity to be with you today and offer some of my ideas about. Uh, the eruption of these other uh, soil epistemologies, ontologies, uh, and materialities that are displayed in the global south, besides uh, modern soil science, in the context, in the current context of, we, of what we are facing in the capitalist global crisis. Um, I will take about one hour, one hour and 10, 20 minutes. I will try to talk slowly. Uh, my English is not that good. I have a heavy Latin American accent and I'm not used to speak English. So I'm a bit of nervous about it, 
So that then I'll try to uh, offer my ideas uh, and in a clear, I, I hope, way and my insights uh, about this in, important, interesting issue. So, as you see, this is my, my title. I, I would like to, to talk during these uh, minutes about who are the, the peoples, the persons and the communities that are now uh, um, erupting uh, with their soil epistemologies and soil uh, ontologies, mainly in the global south, in the current uh, global crisis. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, present three of the main aspects that I would like to, to talk today. The first one is the political emergence of other soil epistemologies or ontologies besides the modern soil science in the group and the current global context. I would like to offer a context within uh, where I can see this emergency this uh, eruption of uh, communities uh, uh, trying to be more visible uh, and uh, confront uh, what they think uh, is necessary for justice, for food justice, for the transition of agroecology, and uh, for the health of the planet and the, the health of, of us. This, this movement is becoming a, a very important movement in Latin America, and this is linked to uh, this eruption of uh, other soil epistemologies. This is the first aspect that I want to talk about. The second one is who are these guys? Who are the soil epistemologies keepers? which are their current socio-political and ecological contexts, and why are uh, concerned as, uh, uh, why are um, they uh, becoming an emerging, an, an emerging political actors in dispute with transnational extract, extractivism, and extractivism and dispossession. This is the, uh, what is the issue about this emergency of this social movement, and I think it's a global social movement, but I uh, see it from the, south, uh, the global south, and especially from Latin America. And at the end, I would like to uh, give some ideas about the similarities and differences between the modern soul science uh, and the pluriverse of other soil epistemologies, uh, asking how or trying to, to answer how do they display relational ontologies and meta materialities for the maintenance of the global bi biocultural heritage. These are my three main uh, issues, to, uh, questions that I want to discuss with you or I want to present. Um, this is very important. What could soul scientists and the public learn about these other soil cultures, including, and this is also very uh, important, including ethical and moral values for the maintenance of land, soil care, um, soilscapes, socio-ecological resilience and well-being. We call it in Spanish, vivir bien con dignidad. Uh, it's, a, it's a philosophy of uh, indigenous peoples in, in, in Latin America. And this uh, bien vivir, buen vivir is, is becoming also um, a strong philosophical movement uh, within the region. And it is, um, um, I don't know how to say, it's uh, many people, millions of people are now uh, fighting uh, in tension with uh, governments for the uh, uh, resolving of the socio-ecological problems that we are facing in Latin America and also at the global, uh, uh, at worldwide level. No? Mm, first of all, I don't use the concept of Anthropocene because I think that uh, not human, not all human beings 
have been uh, the actors of disrupting the health of the planet. I think uh, when we try to understand the actual crisis that we are facing nowadays, it is because a ideological and economic and political system that is taking place since at least 500 years ago, which um, with its ontology, it is uh, disrupting uh, the health of the planet, the health of, of, of humankind, and uh, capitalism is uh, the system that is provoking this. So uh, in this sense, uh, I don't believe that all of us are uh, acting negatively. I think that many of us, we are uh, doing uh, things, activities to reduce this uh, uh, crisis that we are facing, especially after the pandemic, the, the COVID-19, which is a cruel pandemic, and it's also has been a cruel pedagogy, a, cr a cruel education that uh, is showing us that we need to change drastically, transform radically, transform our ways of, of living in this beautiful planet. And by this, we need to uh, find the ways to open and widen an alternative civilization horizons. We are living in a bifurcation. If we keep on doing business as usual, we will have uh, many problems within the next uh, 30, uh, three, four decades. And so we have to, to, to do something. We have to change our ways of, uh, of living, our ways of doing uh, our uh, daily lives uh, on, on Earth. And uh, this bifurcation is important and it's, it's not a, a future uh, movement, but it's now uh, uh, coming, becoming and widening uh, in, in many parts of the world. So capitalism instead of Anthropocene. What is the great dilemma about it? You know? The great dilemma about this uh, current uh, global crisis is that um, since 500 years ago, um, there has been a, an hege hegemonic power within this uh, political and economic system that believes that the world is made of only one world. His world, its world, no? the modern world. There is no, no other world and the truth uh, with upper um, uh, capitals uh, is uh, uh, made by this uh, Western view of uh, how civilization should be um, uh, on the way. On the contrary, there is an eco-political eruption of uh, millions of persons uh, movements all around the globe, but basically uh, within the South Global, the Global South, that uh, are precluding that the world is made of many worlds. This is very important to discuss because this eruption is, is making visible what has been obscured by capitalism what has been obscured by, by exploitation, what has been obscured by this irrational uh, modern way of living in, uh, in our house, the only one house that we have that is the planet. So this is a great dilemma, how to change this uh, hegemonic way of thinking about uh, the world and how experience, human experience, should be, um, how do I say, um, strengthened and see that experience, human experience, is an, an important, a crucial issue, a strategic, a strategic issue for reducing the impacts of what have been, uh, what, what have been experienced by um, these uh, 
capitalism uh, uh, disruption since, uh, uh, as I say, 500 years ago. So this is the great dilemma, what I think uh, is becoming a, an important issue when we discuss about soils, when we discuss about nature, when we discuss of our health and our lives. One uh, interesting issue to, to discuss about this crisis is perhaps uh, showing that the majority of the global, the global food production is produced by peasants all over the world, uh, peasants who are uh, producing food in uh, five hectares on average and are producing more than 70% of the total food that humankind is, uh, uh, well, is eating. Uh, and from this 70 to 80%, 50% of the food that is produced globally is produced by these peasants that mainly are indigenous peoples in their territories or small farmers in their communities all over uh, the world, but especially within the intertropical fringe of the planet. This is very important because uh, what uh, we will see later on is that they are maintaining the biocultural heritage, which was produced as a co-evolutionary um, effort uh, and that uh, diversity is a strategic issue to understand health, to understand why is this crisis uh, deepening and why these persons have the experience to overcome what we are facing today. One example, very interesting example is that uh, a little bit less than 10% of the total global food that is produced, it comes from cities, mainly from uh, peasants, families, indigenous uh, communities that had to move, had to migrate to uh, the cities, especially these big cities in Latin America. And uh, besides that, or uh, having been uh, migrated, they still uh, produce uh, an important amount of, uh, of food. Also, when we thought, thought about uh, hunters and gatherers or uh, small fishermen, fisher, fisher communities, et cetera, et cetera, we think that this is the past, that uh, these hunter-gatherers uh, societies are just uh, uh, the past and they are not uh, uh, um, doing uh, their own uh, production nowadays. They are here today and they're producing more than 10% of, of the total food that is produced uh, globally. On the contrary, 30% of the world food that comes from the industrial food chain or the agribusiness uh, is uh, uh, used especially for uh, producing food for animals and not directly for humans. And these are the, the causes, the causes of this pandemic, these are a big causes of what we are facing about land degradation, soil erosion, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they don't produce, as they say, the, 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 the most important amount of food that is produced globally. They produce money. They don't, they don't care about food. They care about uh, uh, accumulating and they care about money, they care about business. So in fact, uh, small farmers all over the world are feeding us. And this is an important issue because it's a political issue. When we see this, when we uh, uh, analyze this information, then we understand why these uh, millions of billions of farmers are in tension with agribusiness because of uh, land grabbing, because of mines, 
because of many uh, problems that we are facing and, and uh, these peoples are facing in their territories. But there's also, uh, I would like to show this also, the, the distribution inequalities, injustices. No? What you see, the, sorry, this is in the Spanish, it's, it's in Portuguese, but what you see on the right hand side is uh, information about agribusiness. Agribusiness produce just 30% of the total global food. Uh, they don't uh, offer too much uh, work, rural work, just 26% of the rural work is, is given by transnational. Uh, they, uh, I, I don't know how to say, they, they grab 86% uh, of the credit, the rural credit, and they uh, hold 76% of the agricultural land. This is a business. It is more important to control land, to control credit, to control uh, production than to produce food. On the other hand, on your left hand side, this uh, information reinforces what I said before. 74% of, of, of the work that is done uh, in rural territories is uh, offered by rural communities, small farmers, indigenous peoples. They offer work uh, 74%. They produce 70% of the global food. They do it just in 74% of the agricultural land of the world. And they just don't have credit to uh, increase uh, production. No? So these are inequalities, and soil science is uh, an issue here. We will see later on why soil science is directly uh, involved in these two uh, aspects of the global uh, food inequalities. And here the strategic issue is that uh, the maintenance and enrichment of health and diversity in times of crisis uh, is part of the survival strategy and the enlargement of life. What do I want to say uh, by this? Diversity is an issue, a very strategic issue. If we want to continue living in this world, we have to reverse diversity loss. We have to enhance diversity and I use diversity in an ample uh, way. Diversity of species, diversity of languages, diversity of cultures, et cetera, et cetera. Diversity is the result of the history of our planet and is the uh, result of the history of the rural peoples since more than 10,000 years ago, at least. So if you want to keep or maintain health or restore our illness, we should have to um, find the ways to reverse this diversity loss. And within, uh, because of this, we then can uh, uh, pretend that we can then uh, survive. We can then build strategies for survival and the enlargement of life of humankind and of all other uh, non-humans. I'm going to talk about species and then I'm going to talk about languages. These two uh, uh, issues, these two aspects uh, are very important to understand the crisis we are uh, facing today. This graphic shows, and you know this graphic, I, I, I am pretty sure that you know this graphic, is a history of, the, of Gaia, uh, of the planet, making an effort since four to five million, uh, thousands of billions of years to uh, um, widen diversity. In this case, it's biodiversity. The history of our planet of Gaia is not a linear history. 
it has been a very complicated history when where you can see in these red uh, percentages um, the planet has been facing in his history uh, uh, many problems and because of these uh, problems uh, sometimes the loss of species were very very important this is the case for example of, a ha of what happened in the Cret Cretaceous uh, period when a meteorite uh, impacted the Earth, the planet, our planet, and within 60 years, more than 11% uh, of the total uh, diversity, biological diversity, was lost. What is interesting to see in this graphic is even though that uh, the planet experienced uh, not nice times, uh, difficult times, uh, it was capable to recover and as you see at the uh, right hand side of the graphic, uh, the peak of uh, biodiversity is uh, uh, something that is uh, very important to uh, consider. We are living in a moment where the, the planet Earth, Gaia, is happy or was happy and was producing uh, a diversity never happened before within this uh, planet history. But confronting this, current, the current rate of species extinction is up to 500 times greater than that of the Cretaceous. So we are losing species, we are losing experience, the planet is losing experience, it is, and this is one issue, and this is becoming a part of the uh, <clears throat> global crisis that we are facing today. Gaia made an effort, has been making an effort to extend life, inclusive our, our own life. On the other hand, when we talk about species, we are talking about, about million, millions of species around. 30 million of, of species are, are considered to live in the planet. Uh, of course, uh, the amount uh, of, of species that are known is just a, a, a small amount if we consider that uh, most of the microorganisms have not been discovered and they don't have names and they and science uh, have not the capacity yet to um, understand their uh, uh, what they are doing and how they are living, etc., etc. On the other side, languages are not more than 8,000 languages uh, all around the, the, the planet. Most of these languages are endemic languages. These languages are used, are, 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 are speak by uh, societies less than 100,000 people endemic societies, mainly located within the intertropical fringe of the planet, as you can see. The, the issue here is that the rate of extinction of languages is 400 times greater than that of a species. We are losing the human experience because language is the staple food of communication, is a, is a staple food of, of understanding the reality of communicating between us, among us, and understanding uh, our uh, realities uh, in a pluriverse uh, of uh, ontologies, of cultures that uh, are uh, uh, located around the world. 400 times, that means that by the end of, of this century, probably, I don't want to be a catastrophe, uh, catastrophist, but uh, current data showed us that uh, probably at the end of, the, of this century, more than 90% or 80% of these languages will be lost. If we lose lang a language, we lose the species. If we lose languages, we lose experience. If we lose experience, we lose diversity. And we, if we lose diversity, 
we lose uh, health. These two are just an example of what is happening about the loss of diversity. And to understand better the, the, important of, the importance of understanding this uh, extinction process that we are facing today, there is a co-evolutionary axiom that says the loss of a species, a species and the loss of languages is the loss of experience of the global biocultural heritage. So we are facing this currently. The understanding of the world is broader than the Western understanding of the world. This is what um, a Portuguese sociologist, Boaventura de, Sa uh, de Sousa Santos, uh, is, all, uh, is uh, explaining why uh, modern thought is just one thought, it's just one world, it's just one ontology. It's, it is not uh, the pluriverse of ontologies or epistem epistemologies of the ways we uh, understand reality. So when we lose languages, we lose words. We lose, when we lose languages, we lose ontologies or the ways we construct our reality. What we can say is, is that there is an infinite diversity of the world, and this is becoming an important issue that gives us hope besides uh, the current uh, global crisis that we are facing. Multiple knowledges or epistems refer to multiple worlds or ontologies. This uh, we call the pluriverse, and these pluriverse have been uh, not visible because of the Western mind, because of the Western thought, because of, of the Western modernity thought. But uh, since a uh, few decades ago, a great movement, a social movement, political movement is showing that it's just that it, the, the world is, uh, 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 how did I say, organized by many worlds and not just by one world, their world, their only two. So what does not exist is actively produces as not existent or as a non-credible alternative to what exists. Is This is what the modern thought is thinking about. More than a universe or universal thought, we live on a pluriverse. And this is important to understand in order to build alternative uh, uh, civilization horizons. And we don't have too, too much time to uh, uh, promote the radical transformation of our lives. But what are these civilization transitions? I will complex displacement from the domain of a single model or suppose of a supposedly globalized, usually characterized as Western, and defined as heteropatriarchal capitalist modernity, to the let me see, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see. Mm, one, please, sorry. Okay. Nope. Sorry. So um, what I want to say here, what I want to show here is the world is, is built uh, by many worlds and, and, and these many worlds should fit uh, as a pluriverse if we want to survive. This civilization crisis requires to understand that there are multiple worlds and these worlds are the pluriverse and most of these worlds, they have, they have experience to reverse uh, the crisis that we are facing. There's a lot of experience to change the pace of this uh, uh, velocity of uh, 
you know, the crisis deepening. So a pluriverse is very important to understand and thinking the global in terms of many wars. Many wars is not just about talking a critical stand against mainstream theories. It is to assume a politically emancipatory position that includes processes of knowing and also defending other possible ways of being in the world. This is very important. The pluriverse then is where the natural, the religious, spiritual, the political and social are not separated, as is the stance of the modern thought. Fragmenting reality, separating nature from culture, separating object from subject, separating men from, from female, etc., etc., has been the development of a very strong uh, thought that has uh, um, provoked uh, this uh, crisis that we are facing. If we understand that we live in a pluriverse, then we'll have the, the, the chance to reverse this crisis and to find many possible ways of building future. And another issue is biocultural diversity. I consider biocultural diversity the immunological system of the planet. As I said, diversity is a strategic issue if we want to keep living in this planet. If we lose more diversity, if we lose diversity, then we'll have uh, uh, problems and probably will uh, not be uh, in uh, living uh, uh, in, in this planet and will have uh, the extinction will be part of our species. And this biocultural diversity is the historical role of indigenous and peasant peoples in the construction, maintenance, and enrichment of the global biocultural wealth. It's a result of the agroecological experience developed over the centuries by rural peoples. And you can understand this biocultural diversity because there is a close correlation between the linguistic, biologic, and agricultural mega diversity located fundamentally in the intertropical fringe of the planet. What this uh, biocultural diversity uh, is given uh, is a sustainable and synergistic, synergistic co-evolutionary systems that contrast with the standardization of cultures, agricultural systems, and the relation the strategies of coexistence with non-humans due to current globalization. So biocultural diversity is important because it's the immunological system of the planet. Let me show you this, this map. This map, you see the red polygons uh, here. Uh, this, uh, well, I want to use a met metaphor. I see the planet as a, as a lung, as a lung with cancer and heavy metastasis. It's a nil lung. It is facing a lot of problems. And these uh, red uh, areas that you see in this map are the healthiest areas of the planet. These are areas where you find the highest biodiversity in the world, the percentage in the world, the highest language diversity within the planet, and the highest diversity of agricultural systems all along the planet. They have more than 10,000 years of history. They are healthier, but facing problems as the Amazon, uh, as uh, other areas that are now experiencing extractivism and dispossession. So for me, these red areas are the healthy values of the law. These are critical areas 
that we should keep healthy, that we should uh, work for enhancing diversity there, for maintaining diversity there, and for maintaining mainly experience, human and the Earth experience. This is another example. You see at the uh, right-hand side, uh, the, what I call the empire of soybean. This area, it covers more than the total surface of France. This is transgenics. This is a glyphosate. This is uh, monocultures. This is the monoculture of the mind, as our colleague Vandana Shiva uh, said to us. This is what we are facing, uh, degradation of soils, climatic change, uh, the in social inequality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what I call the black spots. This is what we uh, should um, reduce by uh, uh, making efforts to convert these black spots into cold spots. Cold spots, I call cold spots, uh, for example, the Amazonian, the Amazon uh, is a cold spot. It's a lung in itself, uh, also with the, uh, the pole, North Pole. And uh, the Amazon has more than uh, 10 years of, 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 of experience building a beautiful domestic garden. When the Portuguese arrived to the Amazon, uh, around seven to 14 million people were living there. And then they didn't uh, destroy the forest. What they did is they domesticated this forest. They produce within this forest, and so far they have the most productive soils in the world, the black Indian soils, the mulatto soils, what are now called the biochar. This is an example of what we are facing nowadays. This is the tension between living or dying, between uh, enhancing diversity in experience or reducing our time in the planet, or reducing the wealth and the diversity that we uh, produce uh, during these uh, at least uh, uh, 10,000 years. Interesting, this is the first uh, global map of communal land. This is communal property. This is where food is produced uh, by indigenous peoples. It is not more than 30 to 40% of the total uh, land, agricultural land, but it holds uh, more than 80% of the global biodiversity uh, that is located in these communal lands. This is also an important issue. Property, the way soil is used, is a, an important issue and a strategic, a strategic issue for maintaining pedodiversity, soil function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see in this picture is the wealth of life. It's our experience in Latin America. It's a uh, smile, tender, passion, hope, struggle, diversity, experience, fight, tensions. We are here and we think that we know how to resolve some of the problems that we are facing currently. We think that our ontologies, relational ontologies, would help to build a pluriverse, a world made by many worlds. What is important in this issue is to consider that there is no nature without culture, and no culture without nature, that this is a link that in fact, 
Nature is a concept just used by modern thought. The vast majority of cultures, they don't have nature as a, as a concept, as a name, as a word. They don't conceive nature as separated from culture. In Spanish, I call culturalesas. In English, uh, we may say nature cultural scapes. You cannot separate nature from culture and vice versa. So the modern thought is, is a minority thought and is not universal. It is impossible to fragment reality and it is absurd. We don't do it in our everyday life. This thought has caused many problems all around the earth, and we should uh, understand this ontology, the modern ontology, which is a strong one, in which it has power, is an hegemonic one, but uh, is also uh, uh, facing us that uh, the how modern thought is thinking is not the most intelligent way of thinking. There is now and here a vast multiplicity of explanatory regimes about the world in non-Western societies, mainly in America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania, and in the Pacific, where such a tacit separation does not exist. Humans and non-humans, including more than humans or the supernatural, maintain lively interpersonal relationships. The land, soil, plants, rain, mountains, rocks are persons, are living beings, and they do not exist as individuals. They exist because of their relations. This is what we call uh, 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 onto, uh, relational ontologies. They are not uh, objects. They have agency. They have a volitive uh, uh, possibility. They have mind. They have thoughts. And they can communicate with persons, with human persons. Non-humans, soils, mountains, rocks, stars, and constellations, meteorological phenomena, animals, etc., have agents like humans, all of them forming relational collectives. The connectivities between them unfold on the same cosmic substrate, which each person, human and non-human, offers a point of view on this complex social world. This is a totally different way of thinking about reality and constructing worlds where souls are strategic and very important as living beings, as having agency, besides modern soil science that discusses soil as an inner object. We have to change this way of thinking. We have to think about how other peoples, the majority of the people in the world, think about soil, use soils, and interact with soils. So much different than the agribusiness effort to produce, uh, uh, trying to increase productivity, productivity, money, 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 and reducing diversity. No nature, no culture, nature's culture escapes. Make aware that the way in which the West represents nature is the least shared in the world. In many regions of the planet, it's not conceivable that humans and non-humans live in incommunicable worlds and according to separate principles, the environment is not objectified as an autonomous sphere. Plants and animals, rivers and rocks, meteors and seasons do not exist in the same ontological niche defined by their lack of humanity. So in fact, these relations between humans and non-humans and more than humans are political. 
are cosmopolitical. There is no separation between nature and culture, and the relations are personal relations and are political relations. This is an issue when you talk with a farmer in Colombia, in Mexico, in India, in Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. And when they try to uh, offer us uh, the way they understand the world and the, and the, the way they, they uh, relate with other entities, uh, in a very emotional way, in a very also intelligent way, what they offer us is that all living beings, all, all entities are living beings, and the most important thing is how to relate with them. This means that uh, there has to be an ethical and moral, moral values to maintain this diversity, to maintain these relations, which is a complex uh, issue because the web is so, the web of relations is so complex. In, the, in, in this matter, ethnopedology, soils, what are the role of these, of soils within this uh, 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 relational ontologies? And what is ethnopedology? In fact, ethnopedology, uh, soil, modern soil science is also an ethno, uh, science, because it's built by ethnic, by a culture. And we can even use uh, ethnopedological uh, approach to analyze the modern soil science thought, because it has a culture, because it, 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 it becomes from, from a, a, a dualist ontology, because uh, there is a truth constructed by modern soil science, uh, assuming the fragmentation or the separation between uh, nature and society or nature and culture. So we can use ethnopedology even to analyze critically what is uh, be, uh, behind uh, modern soil science efforts to understand this uh, living being, which are the main issues that are uh, uh, based on, that based uh, their, their thoughts, that based their, their way of thinking. Ethnopedology is an hybrid uh, discipline. It's a dialogue discipline, dialogical discipline. It's an hybrid discipline because it merges uh, social with natural science. Ethnopedology is a long conversation with farmers and other uh, soil users about the soil dominion, the soil land dominion. It's a long conversation. It's not just a technical issue. It's a political issue. It's a cultural issue. And to understand this complexity, we need to use uh, the tools of several uh, scientific disciplines and to understand uh, to comprehend which are these soil ontologies that uh, are maintaining the uh, more, most percentage of biodiversity and soil diversity in the world. Yes, ethnopedology requires to understand the soil, the, the, the soil as a world in relation. Uh, as a swarm of natural cultural escapes. And by that, we used to understand there is no separation between the cosmovision or ontology or the, the creation of a world or reality by communities as one of the lenses that helps to practice, to, 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 to produce materiality or the cosmo action Within, with, with another lenses that is the epistemology of or uh, the cosmos knowledge. These three dimensions that are interlinked uh, permits to understand these relations as cosmopolitics, no separation between nature and culture. 
This cosmopolitics helps understanding, understanding the ordering principle of life and dwelling with meaning. Cosmopolitics, these re uh, relations, this complex web of relations, uh, is uh, what I think the feeling, thinking, and knowing, being, doing in the world. And the territory world is a vital socio-cosmic field. No separation between the, na between the natural and the sacred, between the natural and culture, between the natural and the subjects, between the natural nature and us. The vast majority of rural cultures in our planet, with a pluriverse of cultures, of course, different ways of constructing worlds, they don't separate. They organize their world and their relations, not separating ontology from epistemology and both from practice. These are interlinked and this constitutes the territory world or the vital socio-cosmic field. Let's see some of the difference between how we scientists uh, characterize nature of soil and how the other soil ontologies characterize this living being. For us, nature or soil is a natural resource. It's a useful nature. Otherwise, we don't care about it. It has a monovalent character. It's a means of production. It's commercial or crematistic, but has a crematistic value. It has an un unidimensional character. It's a material group. It's a biophysical component as a subject of study, etc. It is understood, it is thought an instrumental character. It's an object or means of exploitation. It means a fragmented nature, and it's an inner, it has an inner character. Its character, soil, is an anime, an animate object without volition, nature with no agency. This is what we think about soils and about nature in our laboratories, in our fieldworks, in our expl explanations about uh, our world, our truth, our reality. But there is a big difference between what we see when we look at the soil and what we want uh, the other worlds see when, when they look at the soil. When they look at the soil, they see land, they see territory, they see world, they see cosmos. They just don't see the three-dimensional aspect of the soil body. Even they have a fourth a dimension, which is a spiritual uh, dimension of that soil body. The name of the soil is a contextual, it has a contextual meaning. Soil has many names. It depends on the context. It's polysemic and it's a poly, it has a polyvalent character. It's a life giver, it's a means of subsistence, and a primordial symbolic meaning. It has an immeasurable value. It's not just money, it's not just commercial, it's not uh, just a crematistic value. It has a, a sacred value. The multidimensional character about the soil in these realities it's just the no separation between the material and the spiritual uh, aspect of the soul. It's a support and it's a guide. It has an organic confronting with this instrumental character by modern soul science. It's an entity with life in reciprocity, a web of reciprocity. And it has intelligence. It has, it's a subject with agency. It's a nature culture state. 
I don't know if I can explain this uh, complexity and these differences or similarities between um, these uh, soil ontologies, but in my opinion, uh, the maintenance of soil uh, of, of biodiversity is because of these ontologies, is because of this way of thinking about the soil, is because of this way of acting with the soil. It's, it is about how to dialogue with the soil. It is about relations, uh, emotional, sacred, immeasurable uh, uh, relations by ritual that are expressed in these realities. It is not an object, it is not an inner object. It is not an instrument, it is not, it is organic. It has intelligence. This graphic makes me uh, very fast uh, show the, the, this uh, complex uh, uh, inextric inextricable links. On the, on the one on the right, uh, on the left hand side, humans, women, men, and ancestors, uh, ancestors, what we call deaths in, in modern thought, uh, are linked with other uh, than humans, with symbolic, uh, with, sorry, sacred uh, deities, energies, substances, and supernatural forces, or the sacred world. And the non-humans, plants and animals, soils and mountains, these three dimensions are interlinked and constitute the web, the complex web of relations. And there is no separation between the material world and the ritual world. Rituals are part of the material world. I will go further on in, in, in this coming minutes. This uh, communion of relations, of a complex world of relations, are done as a collective work. Collectivity, reciprocity, complementarity, communality give us health. This is uh, the staple food of maintaining diversity and as a consequence, maintaining health. So this has to be done as a generation and regeneration of the cosmopolitical balance. There has to be a balance and ritual and material work play a, a, a strategic uh, uh, a role for man maintaining this cosmopolitical balance. On the one, on the on the right hand side, you see a Mayan shaman asking for 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 uh, fertility of soil and for rain. And on the other hand, you see an Indian uh, agricultural uh, agri father that is producing uh, food, staple food, maize in this case, using. Uh, an Egyptian uh, tool and uh, animals that were not here before the European contest. So in that sense, uh, soil ontologies, uh, these relational soil ontologies are not pure. They are a mixture of experiences brings, brought by Europeans, brought by science, brought my many experiences and it's a mixture of uh, ways about thinking of the soil land domain. I will not go very deep on this, but how this is maintained, this, this uh, balance, this equilibrium is maintained by a dialogue. And the dialogue is between humans and non-humans and the more than humans or the sacred world uh, uh, is uh, plays a mediated role between humans and non-humans. They are like the, how do you say, reference. They do offer advice, they punish, they give uh, gifts. It depends on the balance and it depends on the relations that uh, are uh, uh, in action. No? This dialogue action 
uh, is mainly to conjure risk and uncertainty. In these ontologies, uncertainty cannot be avoided. We don't have the power to avoid uncertainty. We don't have certainty about the world. So uncertainty is one of the main issues uh, that requires the dialogue between these three dimensions. And this is done by work. And work and health in reciprocity are three premises for the maintenance of this balance of life. In, in one hand, humans shape their landscapes by reconciling with non-humans, with deities through their extensive repertories of knowledge, epistemes, and their ontological meanings. On the second hand, non-humans work in constant negotiations through the intermediation of, of the sacred world. And in the third aspect or dimension, deities work to balance an action between humans and non-humans. The sacred is important. The spiritual dimension is important when we want to understand the soil ontology in these realities. Work, a collective work in reciprocity and resilience are uh, the result of, of produced uh, are the result of ritual and material work that seek to reverse the impacts of landscape territory while maintaining or increasing harmony, uh, stability, uh, lessening or restoring contingent or unpredictable events as an adaptive strategy. So these ontologies, what they do is they uh, build adaptive strategies and resilience is one key issue, one category, one analytical category or concept that should be understood within these uh, constructions of the soil walls or of the walls. And there are theories. How to balance the world, the reality in these walls, imbalances considered an illness. And the tension between bias, health, and illness is given by conflicts and breakups and surprises. So, to overcome a chaotic chaos or cosmic uh, chaotic order, we have to do a restoration to uh, overcome these tensions and to produce tensions a new state of health. And this is done by sacred world, as I told you, by the sec secular world, world and the non-human. And in this issue, theories, which, which are, uh, how do you say, rhizomatic or common sense uh, theories that are shared by many soil cultures among the world, uh, they use, ways of understanding their balance and their relations. One of these uh, issues is the relation between hot and cold, and between dry and humid. Hot, dry. Hot and dry are masculine substances and energies that are descended, that comes from the sky, from the sacred tree. Cold and humid, it's a female substance or a female substances and energies that are ascended, that comes from uh, beneath the earth. The relation between hot, cold, human, and dry can offer a balance, and it depends on the type of relation that is produced. And this relation, this balance, uh, is uh, mm, restored or, or reinforced by these three types of work, the sacred, the secular, and the non-human work. Yeah. 
uh, fast. I'm going to go faster. This is an example. This is an ethnic group in Mexico, the Purépecha. In Mesoamerica, in uh, Middle America, uh, a civilization core uh, that lasted more than uh, 10,000 years until the European arrival, maize is the symbolic meaning of life, of wealth, of uh, relation, of health and diversity. Maize is a staple food. We said that we Mexicans are made of maize. And with that maize, we don't have a country. This maize is a bisexual maize. When it has two cones, it, it, it shows abundance, abundance. And what is interesting is that this bisexual uh, plant or crop has of course, female organs, masculine organs, they, it does not reproduce itself, but it shows the integration of the world, of reality. Male and female are together as sacred entities that produce life, that produce diversity. Uh, when we when we born, when we are born, independently of the sex, we are more female than when we die. When we die, independent of we are female or male, we have more male qualities. Female are considered uh, affinities or qualities related to birth. Humidity, uh, sickness, sick, sickness, propensity, uh, dark colors, tender, length. Masculine affinities or qualities are considered to be related with death. Dry, yellow, hard, and aerial. This uh, understanding of life is used to construct the world and construct the soil ontology. And what is interesting is to see, for example, that ethnopedological studies show a detailed geomorphical, geomorphic map with similar uh, relief classes than the technical. We don't need geomorphologists. We have our own classification, relief classification. And of course, we want to uh, build a dialogue and understand what we don't understand and, and enhance our experience. But in fact, these walls, they have a very deep and complex understanding of nature. They have very complex world uh, soil system, uh, classification systems. Uh, but these systems are dynamic. Uh, be, perhaps the main difference between Modern soil science and, and other soil epistemologies is that soil science acknowledge that to understand soils uh, should use the genetic or the origin origin of the soils, the birth of the soils, uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, geological, uh, pedogenetical origin. And the other soil cultures recognize that Diet is the sacred was the giver of soil's life. Another issue which I think is very important is that soil, the modern soil classification is based on sub-horizons uh, 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 and, 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 I don't know how to say uh, horizons which are not the, the superficial horizons 
and, and are more stable. And so you can understand, understand soil evolution, soil development by using this stable criteria on this area of the soil body. On the contrary, as farmers, these soil worlds recognize the most important uh, dynamic issue of the soil within the first 100 centimeters from the superficial uh, uh, land. Uh, why? Because it's the agronomic uh, surface and it's more dynamic. There is no uh, modern soil classification of the superficial layer of the soil, the agronomic layer of the soil, which is the most important one, which is the most dynamic one, which is the most uh, uh, fragile one in, in some cases. So these are differences that uh, we face when we try to uh, compare modern soil science classification systems or uh, understanding of the soil with these other soil worlds. For these cultures, also lie uh, soil or land groups and behaves. It has, or she has because it's a female, she has uh, uh, evolution or agency, and it's related, it's related uh, all along the profile from the upper crest of the mountain onto the bottom lands of the valley. There is an interrelation of sediments and soils within, uh, within the upper crest of the mountain are considered more female, more male soils. And uh, soils from the bottom land are considered having more uh, female uh, uh, affinities or qualities. This relation between male and female are discussed in a very complex way when we talk about erosion, when we, for example, talk about uh, uh, purposely uh, affecting soils for runoff or soil erosion to offer uh, soil qualities to uh, soils at the bottom who, has, who have uh, female uh, affinities. So the inter uh, mix of soil qualities and female qualities produce fertility. This is very complex. I will not go uh, deeper on this, but uh, it's a very, very interesting. Many soil scientists, they consider that uh, farmers do not understand the soil profile. What you see here is a characterization of a soil profile. Even the microbiota, even fauna, uh, the soil fauna, even the relations between soil fauna and roots and uh, other uh, entities that live in the soil profile. Very, very interesting. And another issue. When we talk with farmers about the, the composition soil matter, the, the composition, what we find is that the composition is understood as the interlink or the intermix between female affinities of uh, entities as soil fauna for example, or water with uh, male entities of the same water. For example, in this case, uh, the, the rain is considered having male affinities and vapor and runoff are considered having uh, female affinities. The mixture between male and female produces water good water for the, the decomposition. And all these web of relations are complex, are very well understood and produce vitamins. I use vitamins because they use this word and it, uh, it, it, it permits me, it, 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 it permits me to, to, to say that these soil ontologies are hybrid are not pure uh, vitamins are not uh, vitamin is not it's a modern world and choices 
is uh, the traditional war. Is is the the blood of the of the soil that was produced by a web of relations of many entities. And finally, uh, the technical soil map and the local soil map shows that there are more classes recognized by, by farmers than by technicians. Besides that is a very expensive to build, to produce a map using uh, laboratory, et cetera, et cetera, than working with people, than working with experience. This is another important issue. It's costless always. And what, what it produces is this beautiful landscape profile, uh, this uh, cross-section, you may say. No? Uh, and this is a synthesis of the inextricable relations between male, hot, dry qualities and female cold, humid qualities for the maintenance of diversity as an enactment for the continuity of the sacred and secular. To begin finishing my talk, the model, the synthesis of a model that I found out, it's a very interesting. Where is the vast majority of agro diversity within indigenous communities of, of, of small farmers? where are considered, considered the areas with higher risks, uh, with lesser diversity? Where do we have to work harder, more intense, intense than other areas of the community? And how these areas are related with male affinities and female affinities? Female affinities, work hard, harder nearby the house or nearby the community. And they maintain the greater, the greatest part of, agro of the community's agrodiversity. They work very intense. They, uh, they care, they have greater care about the living beings that are related uh, to them and they do it on, on shorter distances. The house, the kitchen, the backyard, the organ. But when, when, you, when you analyze ethnopedological uh, research, there is no focus on gender aspects, for example. There is a farmer, man who produces food, female is not uh, on the issue of the soil surveyor or the ethnopedologist while female uh, are the most important keepers of agrodiversity within this uh, world ontologies. That does not mean that, that men is not doing a, a good job. No? It depends on the distance he is capable or more capable or whatever to go to the mountain uh, and so uh, he produces with a lesser diversity, lower intensity, minor care. He does not go every day to the mountain. He, ha he works on the higher risk uh, landscapes and longer distances, mountains, slopes, and plains. So I found this in Africa. I found this model in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. I found this on Andean region. I found this on my country, Mesoamerica, and I found this on Australia and on the Pacific uh, area. So this is what I call a rhizomatic theory. It's a very interesting uh, issue that is not, ta is not taken by ethnopedologists to uh, go beyond the technical uh, aspect that uh, they analyze. And well, the relation between non-humans 
which are this, uh, considered in this central circle, in this case is a meteorological uh, uh, beings that uh, uh, produce rain or whatever during the long year. And this work done by, by these entities provide energies and uh, show humans how to uh, produce food. And the, and the sacred dominion uh, showed by celebrations, rituals, etc., etc., which are uh, given or offered during the most uh, difficult days of the agricultural cycle to overcome by ritual or sacred work, uh, to balance the relations between non-humans, humans, and more than humans. This is what I call the biocultural uh, calendar. And it's a very interesting uh, to show how there is no disentanglement, disentanglement between uh, non-humans, humans, and more than humans. Well, to understand soil science, modern soil science, we have to use we have to understand that it, it comes from the dualist ontology. And the other ontologies, the relational ontologies, have their own uh, way of thinking about the world, of constructing the world. The dualist ontology think mainly about human beings. Nature has to be exploited for the benefit of humans. So this relation between object and subject uh, give uh, this idea of uh, this dualist ontology. For this dualist ontology, politics, for example, are the decision-making process that applies to all members of a human community, just a human community. Democracy, for example, from a form of government between humans and for humans, and not for the sole and for the sole benefit of humans. And praxis activities, humans which are the producers transform the product, but the product does not act in any way on the producer. It is a, a no a, a one way transfer relationship, a monologue. There is no dialogue. On the other words, cosmopolitics is a decision-making process between humans and non-humans, including spirit, spirit beings. This is a relation between entities that are considered persons, and then they have the rights to live in relation, and they have a two dialogue between them and among them to maintain or repair, restore balance. There is no democracy in these communities. There is a cosmocracy, a pluriverse of form of social coexistence between humans and non-humans, including spiritual beings, according to cultural agreements and norms, the ethos or the ethical and moral values. And finally, cosmoaction or cosmopraxis means that all existing entities are defined as persons maintaining capacity to act, to enact, uh, to feel and to think collectively uh, and to practice relational uh, political activities. The one, the modern thought is produced by the world made of one, one single world. The other, the pluriverse, is a world made by, of many worlds. So, why do we have a, uh, what is the relation between peak oil and peak soil besides the debate about how to measure, et cetera, et cetera, land degradation, soil degradation? Who are at the peak oil and the peak soil? Uh, organizing the destruction? And who are the keepers of soil fertility? 
despite being the poor, the subordinate peoples, the exploited ones, the invisible ones, but that they are maintaining the vast majority of the biocultural heritage. And as, and as I said before, biocultural system or biocultural heritage or, or diversity is the immunologic system of the plant. If we keep to maintain or maintaining biocultural diversity and enhancing or widening uh, alternative uh, civilization horizons and producing pluriverse, then I think we can have hope. Then I think we may overcome what we are facing today. We have to learn. We have to understand that global social justice is not possible with that global cognitive justice. And I, and I say this about the soil world. Soil scientists should be aware of this, should change the way they think about the others. They should change the ways about relate, relating with other pra soil practitioners. It is a very an strategic importance. It is crucial that soil science, which is in a crisis, of course, uh, change the way he looks at the soil world and have, I don't know how to say it in English, a humble, humble, uh, being uh, nice, tender, emotional, not neutral, political, and consider that the others have more knowledge about their own soils, that a soil practitioner or soil surveyor who, who does his soul, his soul or her soul survey during the dry season because he does or she does not want to uh, uh, his or her food uh, to be dirty. No, they don't go when it's, it's, it's important, it's crucial to be there. They want to go during the dry season when land is tired, land is just uh, having fun, and not when it's producing, et cetera, et cetera. So this dialogue is uh, it's necessary for the, because of the pace of our current global crisis. And so, uh, in my opinion, is crucial, is necessary, and I thank you very much. And I think I talk and talk and talk and uh, uh, went more than I said that I was going to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Narciso. Uh, well, a round of applause, virtual applause. Uh, you can only hear me, but uh, uh, thank you very much for that lecture. It was, uh, was full of, of ideas and information. Uh, and I think we all learned uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, things about uh, the importance of cultural and, and uh, biological diversity. Uh, now, before I give the floor to, um, to the audience to, to ask maybe a question or two, I, I would like to, to uh, ask you one uh, particular thing, uh, latching also, also on the conversation that is going on in the, in the chat or has been going on in the chat. Um, during your 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 lecture, uh, one thing that really strikes me in in your work and your ideas is that it's maybe not just a matter of of knowledge, but it's uh, questions of how knowledge are are entangled with particular kind of 
ecological circumstances and practices, right? It's it's not just knowing things about the soil, but it's how things are are implicated in in the way you you work the land and 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 what kind of crops you cultivate in what circumstances, how you read the land very practically. And so, with an eye to that question of um, what can we do uh, practically, basically, um, which has basically been the discussion in the, in the chat uh, during your lecture, I, I would like to ask that question to you. What, in in terms of of practice, I know that you are you are not just uh, developing these ideas as a as a philosopher, but you are some kind of a, an, an educational activist, maybe. And could you say a little bit more about that? So, how does this kind of these kinds of ideas translate uh, practically in in your in your work. Well, uh, Martin, if, if I understood, I, I think that we should go out from universities and we should think about the walls of the universities are porous, and the university of light is as important as the uh, as, as as the scientific universities. But uh, by that, I think that we should engage in practical issues uh, regarding the restoration of our food systems, for example, our food systems, yes, uh, and uh, trying to uh, understand why the others are uh, maintaining agrodiversity while we are keeping on reducing diversity because we want to produce money. Uh, I also think that it's not difficult to dialogue. Dialogue is, 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 is necessary. And uh, we should mm, reconstruct our uh, uh, language, soil language, soil grammatics. To, to, to enhance the, 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 the dialogue. Uh, because farmers are really uh, wanting to, to, to learn. But what we learned over the past 60 years was terrible. The Green Revolution was terrible. They now understand what happened. And uh, for example, in Mexico, the, the less uh, comfortable, I don't know how to say it exactly, but the less comfortable person that goes, a, a person from outside the community that goes to the community is the agronomist. They do, don't, don't believe on agronomists anymore. So how to enhance and how to, to dialogue in, in this uh, 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 new way of education that we need? How, for example, uh, academia or the, the curricula of soil programs should uh, uh, look at the other soil walls and how to relate with the other soil walls, how to produce, for example, soil maps, uh, how to discuss about soil relations, and not just classification or the enhancement, of uh, productivity, uh, which are the role, gender roles about the maintenance of soil health. What does it mean emotions about soil care, et cetera, et cetera. These things are not, uh, are not on, the, on the curriculum, on, are not on the program. Uh, we outsiders go and do our, our uh, survey without even talking with the people that uh, are facing problems or maintaining diversity. We don't know how to use that. Why is not an anthropology course in the, in the soil, soil science, uh, modern soil science program? I was discussing this with, with, with a PhD uh, uh, thesis this, uh, student in South Africa. They want to, to to reveal the, 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 the modern soil science program at the, at the South African universities and are considering methodology and these issues uh, as crucial, as strategic because of the context of, of Africa. No? 
But we also can do that at the north of uh, uh, the Netherlands. I've been there and I know that they have lots of knowledge about soils. Since the end of 19th century, they were facing a lot of problems in the north of the Netherlands and had uh, uh, now very interesting programs on, on soil health, et cetera, et cetera. And many of these soil practitioners of, uh, in northern uh, Netherlands, in the north of Netherlands, are uh, traveling to the Andean region to learn and have a dialogue or dialogues with Andean farmers, and they are enriching their, 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 their knowledge and experience. Enrich experience, enhance diversity, maintain health, restore disruption. I don't know if I. Uh... Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, answer.